महादेव शंभो शिव शंकर महादेव शंभो शिव शंकर शरण आवत तुम्हारे अभयंकर शरण आवत तुम्हारे अभयंकर जय गिरिजा Swati Agarwal, Ehsas Woman of Mumbai of the Prabha Khetan Foundation. And I'm delighted to welcome all the luminaries for the launch of Dr. Vikram Sampath's book, Waiting for Shiva, Unearthing the Truth of Kashi's Gyan Vapi, in the presence of our chief guest, Mrs. Poona Mahajan. Can we all hear it for her? We also extend a very, very hearty welcome to the renowned author, Mr. Ashwin Sanghi. <laughs> Prabha Khetan Foundation is a Kolkata-based non-profit trust founded by an eminent Indian uh, liter literary entrepreneur, philanthropist, social activist, and feminist, late Dr. Prabha Khetan, back in the 1980s. Her vision to create a better tomorrow and her timeless philosophy, Karm Hi Jeevan Hai, have guided us to focus on widening the spectrum of literature and culture worldwide. Ehsas is the women's empowerment wing of the foundation that represents a conglomeration of successful professional women across all spheres of society. The anthem of Prabha Khetan Foundation deserves a special mention. It is ensued by the national philosophy, unity in diversity. The anthem of Prabha Khetan Foundation has been created by musical genius Pandit Vishma Mohan Bhatt. Few places in the world carry the heavy burden of the history as effortlessly as Kashi. The holy city embodies the very soul of our very civilization and personalities and personifies the resilience that we have displayed over centuries in the face of numerous adversities and fatal attacks. Waiting for Shiva, unearthing the truth of Kashi's Gyan Vapi by Vikram Sampath recreates the history, antiquity, and sanctity of Kashi as the abode of Bhagwan Shiva in the form of Vishwanath. Shiva himself assured his devotees of salvation if they leave their mortal coils in the city. Vikramji's latest offering retraces the long history of this bitterly disputed site and the dramatic twists and turns in the checkered past of this Holy Shrine, the long suppressed secrets that lay hidden in Gyan Vapi, finally find a voice through his book. Let us witness a small clipping about his book. Our chief guest for today, Mrs. Poona Mahajan. Please may I request you, ma'am, to join us on stage. Mrs. Poona Mahajan is an Indian politician who serves as the Member of Parliament, Lok Sabha from Mumbai, North Central constituency, representing the Bharatiya Janata Party. She is a brilliant think tank who makes astute political decision, works for the downtrodden, and makes animal rights and welfare a reality as chair of the Maharashtra State Animal Welfare Board. 
Ma'am is a trailblazer, a heterodox, and a champion of social causes. And she makes us wake up from the social topper and urges us to carve a new tomorrow, a new definition of womanhood, and a new India. Can we please hear it for Mrs. Mahajan? Now, may I please request our chief guest, Mr. Ashwin Sanghi, to kindly join us on stage. <laughs> we have another luminary who was catapulted into the literary world after being bombarded with books by his maternal grandfather, the man who has a degree from Yale, but thinks that degrees tend to stifle creativity. The man who balances spirituality of Paramahansa Yoganand with the racy thrill of Jeffrey Archer plots. The man who wanted to compartmentalize his entrepreneurial and literary achievements with the aid of a pseudonym. That is an anagram of his own name. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I have the privilege to bring before you the visionary who is a layered paradox, Sean Hagans, or as we know him better, Ashwin Sanghi, thinker, speaker, writer, bestseller, storyteller, all manifested into one. Next, can I please invite Kushal Meraji on stage. He's the host of the popular Yeah, I think that's Charvaka, he's the, he's the host of the popular Charvaka podcast. He's a former textile entrepreneur. He holds a master's in philosophy. He's also the author of the book, Nastik, Why I Am Not Atheist, which will be launched in the next few days. Thank you, Kushal Meraji, for joining us. Coming to the man of the moment. In the realm of literary luminaries, where words yield the power to shape nations and illuminate the human condition, one name reigns supreme. And that's off, Mr. Vikram Sampath. a master storyteller, a custodian of history, and a beacon of intellectual prowess. His pen wields a transformative force, breathing life into forgotten narratives and illuminating the corridors of the past. With each stroke of his pen, he conjures worlds both distant and familiar, crafting tales that resonate with the echo of bygone eras and the aspirations of modernity. As an author, historian, cultural commentator, Vikramji transcends the boundaries of genre and medium, enriching the literary landscape with his unparalleled insight and unyielding passion. He is the cerebral power shovel, unearthing the buried treasures of history, excavating the forgotten stories and hidden gems that lie beneath the sands of time, illuminating the past with the brilliance of his insight and the precision of his craft. Can we please have a round of applause for the literary genius who deserves every accolade. Mr. Harkaran Singh, General Manager of Orica Sky City, to come up on stage and please felicitate all our dignitaries. The Foundation's love for handloom heritage and traditional arts of India deserves special mention. Authors, artists, and chief guests are felicitated with handloom scarves. And now 
now just the moment we've all been waiting for is here the book launch ceremony requesting all dignitaries to unveil the book honor to call on stage the translators Dr Prachi Jambekar and Maitri Joshi on stage can we please have you We will now have the unveiling of the cover page of the Marathi translation of the book Pratiksha Shivachi Now I cordially invite on stage Tushar Diwan of Agami, a Sanatam Dharm lifestyle brand, to come up and give away some prizes for a contest based on the book that was rung for young people. Okay, so uh, a gentleman in the audience already, uh, you know, did the Har Har Mahadev, but I'd still like to hear it one time, really loudly. Can we have that, please? Har Har Mahadev, please. Har Har. Thank you so much. So once more, once more. Okay. Now it feels like you know we are in a book launch for <laughs> reclaiming Shiva. So firstly, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Vikram Sampaji for giving us a small you know space in this uh, in his book launch and. Uh, I think five years ago, if uh, someone told me it would be cool and acceptable to uh, to be in a you know uh, such a high-end hotel and uh, to have chants of Har Har Mahadev, you know, I, no one no one would believe that, right? But that's the thing that's changing, and I think a lot of credit for that should go to uh, should go to uh, Dr. Vikram Sampaji and others in this uh, domain who have worked so hard for so many decades so that. A young generation like ours might be able to be confident about their cultural identity, their spiritual identity, and their dharmic identity. And uh, and taking inspiration from uh, you know people who have worked so hard for for such a long time, it inspired us to start a small uh, dharmic brand called Agami Stores. It's a Sanatana Dharma lifestyle brand that aims to present. Uh, dharmic concepts uh, to the to a new generation of people in a, in a contemporary style so that they may be able to you know blend in with the world that we are living in today uh, using products that are daily use products like clothes books uh, badges stickers that's just the beginning but uh, that's what we are aiming to do and uh, today we have a couple of uh, gifts that we would like to give away to uh, some of the lucky draw winners I would uh, 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 we had a small contest outside and I would like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Sampaji if he could select uh, select the winners. Okay. So we'll start. We have three prizes today. We are going to start with... Uh, they can pick. Yeah, sure. So we have prize number three first and uh, first you can pick one, just, just one. That's winner number three, and could you read out the name, please? Harish Mansari. Oh, okay. Uh, Now for uh, winner number two.
And now for the first prize, that's the full Agami hamper. Thank you so much. Just the moment we've been waiting for. Kushal Mehraji, I request you to please take the conversation forward with uh, Poonam Ma'am, Vikramji, and Ashwinji. We are in the great city of Mumbai where everybody gets stressed whenever they do something. They're like, Log aayenge ki nahi yaar. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm really happy to see uh, so many people turn up. Uh, not just because. Uh, it's with uh, people who are my friends, but uh, um, when it comes to books, it is one of the most important subjects that we as a society and a civilization should be discussing. So to begin with, I want to thank uh, Poonamji, uh, Ashwin, and I want to congratulate Vikram on behalf of everyone for writing this book. So I, I'll share an anecdote. Uh, so Vikram calls me, Acha, meri tipu ki book likh raho main. and then after three weeks, I get a call from Vikram Sampath says, Acha, ye wali book pehle padh lete hai. <laughs> ye book kar rahe hai. And I was like, Aray, wo book to khatam kar. And, 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 I, I, and I have to say, I've read the book. It is absolutely fantastic. And, and I'm just so proud of uh, the fact that Vikram has uh, written this book because this was a timely book. But um, I want to start with uh, Poonam ji, um, and I'll, I'll explain why. So Vikram, in your book at page 70, I'm going to read this excerpt so that uh, I can uh, take it to her. Uh, you say at Kashi, few, few meters south of the mosque that began to be known as Gyanwapi Mosque, a cruel irony of name considering the Sanskrit nomenclature. Ahilya Bai had a small temple constructed in 1777 over the Linga that had already begun to be worshipped by many after Aurangzeb's axe fell on the Grand Temple. We are in Maharashtra. So, Maharashtra Made. So, I want to talk to a leader from Maharashtra and I want to uh, ask her. My question is that uh, everything in, in life. Uh, we, as much as we want to avoid it, is downstream from politics. Whether uh, the, the method of uh, governance changes uh, at the time of Ahilya by Holkar, maybe the m mode of governance might be different. And today, the mode of governance is different. Now, we have a leader amongst us, a politician. So, how much of a role... Uh, now, how do you distinguish it? Like, your individual belief and faith and the politics surrounding it. पॉलिटिशियन की आवाज दबा रहे थे अब ये सुनाई दे रही है थैंक यू कुशल जी आपको बहुत हैवी हो रहा होगा मुझे जी बोलते वक्त एज मित्रता में नो नो आई विल स्टिक टू द जी दैट्स सो काइंड ऑफ यू सबसे पहले आई वुड लाइक टू थैंक विक्रम संपत जी टू इनवाइट मी हियर व्हेन आई मेट हिम फर्स्ट टाइम आई ही वाज सिटिंग we met for a show and we used to tweet each other. I read his book on Savarkar and being a staunch Savarkar supporter and follower since childhood as my father gave me my first book on Savarkar. So that's the only values I took forward in my life. I saw him in audience because his program had already happened. And after I finished my debate with my fellow political colleague, it was quite heated. But when I went down, I was running. They thought maybe I got scared after heated uh, argument, but it was not that. It was all about looking for my favorite author, Vikram Sampath, and meet him and take one photo with him. And I was so happy. So I don't know what a leader thinks about this, but as a fan, I'm very happy to be here. You wrote about my hero. That's why you're my hero. And Savarkar was so beautifully put, you know, custodian of history. That's what she said, which is the reality because for coming generation of this country, we really need the custodian of our real history, which is now coming out through these books. Um, Kushalji, your question was pretty heavy loaded, but I'm very happy that you came to Maharashtra. I'm really proud to be a Marathi and Maharashtrian and very proud that my friend Vikram Sampath is half Marathi. 
I try to coax Marathi out of him, but it becomes very difficult. It becomes a Tamil Marathi. But uh, when we were discussing this book and when I was reading through it, what I felt great about is the idea of Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj, who actually put the foundation for Hindavi Swaraj. And from there, how Maratha took this forward through Holkars with their Sardars. And when it comes to Ahilya Bhai Holkar, again, born and brought up in a Marathi middle class family where I'm a proper practicing Hindu. Though I'm a politician, but I'm not afraid to say that I'm practicing Hindu and I respect all other religions. Uh, for me, Ahilya Bhai Holkar has been always a part padai for me because in a Marathi medium school, our heroes are very set for us. Uh, we were not in any convent school where the heroes have been you know, somewhere kept aside or invaded by other English heroes. For us, it was all clear what Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj did for us, what Ahilya Bhai Holkar did. And I think I learned a lot for, for Ahilya Bhai Holkar believing, first of all, about a woman. When she's a queen, she can make really things happen. Uh, if you see uh, stories from England to Russia or to India, when a queen has that strength and she's the custodian of her area, she really works on it and she's a very unapologetic queen. A king has his own uh, compulsions to work on, but the queen, a woman, is very clear with her ideas. And that's what I saw. If you know about Ahilya Bhai Holkar, it's not only building temples. The first women army was built by Ahilya Bhai Holkar. The first taxation system in Ma uh, Malwa region done by Ahilya Bhai Holkar. I mean, that's what you also have written in this. So Ahilya Bhai Holkar is... That impresses me so much since childhood. I have built 200 temples in my constituency and I'm not ashamed of it. I'm very proud of it. And you can go and see it everywhere. It just, I don't have to scream and shout uh, on my Twitter profile, but what has to be done is more, jo bolte ho karke dikhate hain, jo yahan pe likha hua hai, wahi karke dikhaya. And I'm very happy, jo hamare itihas pe dhul jami hoi thi. Aaj ho hat gai hai. When you see Kashi Corridor, you're grateful to our Prime Minister because wahi itihas pe jo dhool jami hui thi, jo Ahilya Bhai Holkar ne hamar le sab banaya hua tha, wo dhool hata thi. And now we are proud to say we are fighting for our culture, for our belief, for our Hindutva. And this is what I feel great about this book. Of course, we all are Shiva Bhakt Shiva followers and we always believe in Marathi Desh. Nahi, aisa nahi hai, false in, accusation. I have kept his name as Kushal uh, Nastik Mehra and Poona Mastik Mahajan. So we get along pretty well in that. But Ahilya Bhai Holkar's thought process was very clear and I feel very proud to be as a woman. A woman is a very unapologetic politician. Men have a lot of compulsions. And she showed it here with her belief in Hindutva, belief in temple reconstruction and belief to make her subject to have a better life. So I think this is what I look at it most strongly. Now we have two authors of uh different styles of writing, right? Uh, Vikram ne ka, yeah, and uh, Ashwin, ne ka, Ashwin has taken a prana that uh, thou shall not write uh, non-fiction. And uh, I guess uh, Vikram has taken a prana, thou shall only write uh, non-fiction. So maybe we can start Ashwin and Vikram, both of you chime in. I, I, like Ashwin, maybe you can start here first, that when you, as an author, when you analyze this kind of work, because when we talk about cultural, hist uh, cultural narrations in, in, in our society, it, it, like whether it's you, Amish, and many others, you have tried to explain the, uh, our societal culture, our societal stories through different methods. Now, when you read work like this, if I was to ask you, how does it, uh, influence a you know a fiction popular fiction author someone who's arguably you know if I say number one kisi ka dil dukhega to main bolunga top five main polit main ekdam uh, politically correct uh, karunga iska answer but so how how did you I wanted to know how did you react when you read Vikram See, I, and vice versa Vikram ka main janna chahta hon ki how would you have written if you were writing it in a fictional form should I let Vikram go first no okay. not allowed one who came last always goes last. <laughs> so, you know, um, as a fiction writer, I think we have a luxury which Vikram doesn't have. Yeah. Which is that we can take liberties. Uh, and uh, I, the formula that I have always worked on, uh, Kushal, 
is that I take two words. One is a word called myth, which I frankly, in some ways, have a problem with the word itself. And the other word is history. And I try and bring them together because when they overlap, it creates myth plus history equal to mystery, and which is what I try and do. Uh, there are people who ask me that, uh, you know, uh, what gives you the qualification to be writing on such high funda topics? Uh, because I deal with Mahabharat, I deal with Kurukshetra, I deal with the life of Jesus Christ, I deal with uh, Vedanta. And I say that, look, you know, during my growing up years, my mother always used to tell me that I was a bloody good liar. So I could tell a lie with a straight face. So what I do is I take the work that people like Vikram do and I use that work to build actually the foundation, the beams and the columns. And then there are gaps in that. And those gaps are the brick and plaster which I fill up with fiction. And I have no qualms about doing it because when I was writing a book called Chanakya's Chant, uh, I realized that there was this great character called Chanakya who uh, we now of course teach about in history. But actually if you'll see what has been written about Kautilya, it's very limited. He's written a lot, including the Artha Shastra, the Niti Shastra, but what we get for Chanakya is actually from the Mudra Rakshas, which is a Sanskrit play written 700 years after Chanakya had already passed away. So what if Vishaka Datta was an ancient day Ashwin Sanghi who was combining fact and fiction liberally? And frankly, when I look at history today, for the last 70 years, I'm adding a rider there. George Santana said history is a pack of lies about events that never happened, written by people who were never there. Bolo Vikram. So, <laughs> I am so glad that my, my dear, dear friend Vikram has taken it upon himself. I read not only the two volumes of Savarkar, but I also read this. And frankly, this was one single weekend read. And I instantly messaged him saying how outstanding this is. And it doesn't feel like this has been written in six months. So, for me, it is people like Vikram who make it easier for me Absolutely. to be able to tell our stories. Absolutely. Having said that, Kushal, I think ultimately the objective that we are trying to achieve is pretty much the same. Uh, for me, I am extremely proud of Bharat. And I don't see Bharat as a geographical entity. I see it as this ancient Vedic arc because uh, when, you, when I did a book like Magicians of Mazda, I realized that the word Iran comes from Aryan M. Veja, which is the land of Aryans. Or, for example, if you are looking at, let us say, the Greeks who adopted Varuna uh, as their deity and called him Uranus. Uh, you have the Romans who adopted Mitra. You have the largest Vishnu temple in Cambodia. Uh, you have the kings of the Chakri dynasty who still call themselves Rama. And you have their emblem, which is the Garud. So in that sense, there is so much to be proud of. And so whether it is non-fiction or whether it is fiction, I think this was waiting for a long time that we need to instill a pride in our civilizational roots. Awesome. Very good evening, everyone. And first of all, I must apologize. Uh, I, you know, didn't uh, estimate the traffic in Mumbai as much as I should have. Uh, I thought I come from the capital of uh, traffic jams, Bangalore, but your city hands down beats my city as well. <laughs> no, no, no. So, <laughs> okay, I feel close to Bangalore. Today is a very, very special, a very emotional evening for me. Uh, and I was telling another friend of mine that yesterday when I drove to uh, BKC, the Bandra Kurla complex, my thoughts went back to about 13, 14 years back when that was where I had my first job uh, after my uh, graduation from SPJN College uh, in this very city. Um, I, I was in a very, very boring corporate job, not realizing what I was doing there and why I was doing what I was doing. Uh, thinking that one day I'm going to die just calculating profit and loss of some American firm which will make no difference to my life whatsoever. 
And exactly 16 years ago, in the month of March 2008, was when my first book, Splendors of Royal Mysore, came out. Uh, and I thought it was just a one book wonder, a flash in the pan, and I'll get back to the drudgeries of corporate world. Uh, but thankfully, destiny had bigger plans. And I think the power of surrender uh, in life is something that I've begun to understand. The more you plan something, it never happens. Similarly with the book that you were mentioning, Kushal, uh, I was all ready to bring out a very, very disturbing, difficult book on Tipu Sultan, and I come from Bangalore, so all the more difficult to write about him now, considering there might be by a Tipu… Way, Vikram is genuinely a glutton for punishment, punishment. by the way. <laughs> I can vouch for that. So, yeah, there might be a redux of Tipu Jayanti <laughs> coming there. Uh, but at such an uh, occasion, Mahadev intruded, and how? It was completely serendipitous. In a literature festival, I happened to meet um, a very dear friend, Vishnu Shankar Jain. Uh, he and his father, Hari Shankar Jain ji, I think have been at the forefront of a dharmic uh, you know, war. It's a dharma yuddha that they are fighting single-handedly without any support from uh, political groups or uh, organizations, uh, staking a lot uh, that they have. Uh, and he, it, it was a casual dinner conversation like all Litfests have, we chit chat, gossip. And in that he, he was, he's representing, he and his father are representing the Kashi Vishwanath case in the courts of India, as also the Mathura and several other, Bhoj Shala uh, and other cases. And he was showing me with all the passion at his command that, you know, this is, these are all the details, this is the Ashtamandap lithograph that James Prinzep had uh, made in the 18th century, all of that. And there was a sense of pathos too, that I think people at large do not know what is the history and the background of this entire case. Daily we see lots of news reports in television, in newspapers about Gyanwapi. There's some update every day that is coming around. But what is it that we are fighting about? What is the history of this case? Is it something that is started now or it has its own you know, historical roots going back to not now a few hundred years but almost a century? We, our ancestors have been fighting for this spot for, a, for more than a century now. Uh, and that is why it becomes important for all of us. There is some pitrarin that all of us have uh, to give back as well. Uh, and so. He just told me, can you write a series of articles on this? And that's what I thought it will start with. But then once I entered this alley of the history of the Kashi Vishwanath temple, I realized that there was so much uh, in it and it deserved a full length book. And that's how serendipitously again this book came about. And like they say, you know, if your intent is good, that cliche that the whole universe conspires to help you and all of that, miraculously people started appearing from nowhere. Uh, I had the good fortune of having the Jagat Guru Shankaracharya of the Kudali Shringeri Samsthan, uh, Shri Shri Abhinav Shankar Bharti ji, uh, who got in touch with me from nowhere, from social media actually, and said, I heard you're writing a book on Kashi and I would like to meet you and uh, give you some inputs about this. Uh, and over several long sessions in this Mudhamate, uh, that he tried to instill some, uh, you know, uh, knowledge about the esoteric uh, meaning of what is the shivaling. Now, shivling is derided and spoken of as, you know, phallus worship and the male organ and all that. But is it really that? What is the meaning of a shivling? He said, that's very important for you to include uh, in a narrative on Kashi. What do the Agama Shastras say? Why is that sthala so important in the Hindu, uh, you know, mind? As was mentioned even in that promo, according to the Hindu theology, once a temple, always a temple, uh, because we believe that there is a pran pratishthit murti that has been, uh, you know, invoked in that spot. So even if the murti is khandit or it is not there, the place is imbued with so much divinity, and that's what the shastras say, and with sources and references. The shastras say, the Vedas say is a nice thing to say, without knowing which verse and which chapter. So if you actually, uh, you know, reference that also, then it adds so much credibility to your argument. So, and then I was also very keen that, uh, you know, all the Sanskrit literature is accessed in the original. Uh, now, usually we depend on translations and translations can be really lost in translation with Westerners doing a very half-hearted job, a very biased job. So Shankaracharya ji also introduced me to some Sanskrit pundits in uh, Bangalore and over several weeks and almost uh, a couple of months, several, uh, you know, Puranas, the Shiva Puran, the Linga Puran, the Padma Puran, the Skanda Puran, the Vayu Puran, the Brahma Vaivarta Puran, all these Purans which had significant amount of material about Kashi. 
and the skanda puran had a parishishta or an appendix called kashi khand and the brahma vaivarta puran had a parishishta called kashi rahasya so all these uh, they helped me translate from the original in addition lot of sanskrit nibandhas or long form compositions were written over the ages in the 11th century you had something called kritya kalpa taru by this man called lakshmi dhara who was a minister in the kahadwal kingdom uh, then in the in the 15th century 1460 you had vachaspati mishra who wrote tirtha chintamani then in 1560 you had narayan bhat the very celebrated sanskrit scholar uh, who wrote uh, tri sthali setu on three major sites of which kashi was very important and mitra mishra who later wrote tirtha prakasha so all these texts were also translated the guru charitra in marathi which had a significant portion about kashi about the kashi panchakroshi yatra that uh, was done over the centuries so all these uh, accounts in addition persian accounts uh, of travelers right from albaruni ibn batuta to uh, minhaj e siraj uh, lot of them farishta um, and then the accounts of travelers who came peter mundy a british traveler uh, jean baptiste tavernier a french traveler who came nicolo manucci a venetian traveler all of them had written eyewitness accounts of the kashi vishwanath mandir and how it was uh, ultimately demolished in 1669 by aurangzeb uh, so these accounts were there and the contestations that continued even after in the british courts you had the legal records the colonial records and post independence records so it was literally putting together this whole piece of a very very diverse set of sources and i must say uh, kushal that i think it was like some huge energy had seized me in these 6 months and at times you feel that you are a very fortunate instrument to be chosen for certain things uh, and in this case i totally totally and with hand and held on heart this is a, a project which never crossed my mind it's just that i was lucky to be chosen to do this by mahadev himself now you spoke about the the continuous attempts we we spoke about ahilya bhai holkar and many before that and the continue you also talk about uh, maharaja ranjit singh ji in the book where he also tries to revive the worship and now despite all of that uh i was shocked when when we had this chat on the podcast when we mentioned this fact that a lot of people may not even know that till 1993 the puja in in gyanwapi was actually happening even though in the taikana in the basement uh and just imagine if you're a child born after 1993 so many of them are born and यू विल अज्यूम वहाँ पर तो पूजा होती ही नहीं थी तो ये एक पोलिटिकल निर्णय लिया गया था इट वॉज अ पोलिटिकल डिसीजन सो अगेन पॉलिटिशन से पोलिटिकल बातें करेंगे तो हमें हमारा मंदिर कब मिलेगा स्ट्रेट टू द पॉइंट सो आई वॉज बॉर्न बिफोर नाइनटीन नाइन्टी थ्री सो आई न्यू मेनी थिंग्स अबाउट इट I was a part of the Ram Rath Yatra, which my father started with uh, Honorable Advani Ji. So I was on that Rath when I was just nine years old, and I have seen India how India showered love to a particular party and belief that हमारे राम आएंगे. अभी राम मंदिर हो गया तो ज्ञान वापी तो पक्का ही होगा. मगर फिर the people say कि हम बहुत इच्छुक हैं कि वो जल्द से जल्द हो जाए देखिए अभी 500 साल तो इंतज़ार नहीं करना पड़ेगा लेकिन बात एक है वी आर लॉ अबाइडिंग सिटीजन्स और जब हम हिंदू को एक शब्द बहुत अच्छे रूप से जोड़ा जाता है सहिष्णु कि वो लड़ता नहीं रुकता है सोचता है पढ़ता है डेलिब्रेट करता है हर चीज़ में वो कागज़ ज़रूर दिखाता है कोई कागज़ दिखाए ना दिखाए लेकिन वो कागज़ ज़रूर दिखाता है सो so, कागज जैन परिवार ने दिखाए हुए हैं एंड आई हैव फुल फेथ इन लॉ ऑफ द लैंड एंड आर जुडिशरी क्योंकि मुझे लगता है इस डेलीब्रेशन के रूप से जिस प्रकार से इट साउंड रियली सैड वेन्यू से तहखाना गर्भगृह को तहखाना बोलना साउंड रियली पेनफुल लेकिन उस गर्भगृह को गर्भगृह रहना है 
और आने वाले समय में वो बहुत जल्दी होगा ये मेरा विश्वास है नॉट एज अ पॉलिटिशियन ऑल्सो एज वॉट वी सी एज लॉ अबाइडिंग सिटीजन एंड द वे द कंट्री इज थिंकिंग नाउ विच वॉज रिक्वायर्ड मच मच वे बिफोर धूल साफ हो चुकी है बस अब सब साफ दिख रहा है दैट्स वॉट आई सी एज ज्ञान व्यापी I hope uh, uh, that that happens. Uh, and just but before we go to the future, I think as a historian, I'll pull you back to the past. How like it? Because I think that is more important. You have read the book; they have not. So I think setting a context for the audience is very important. Uh, I think the book has two parallel tracks. One is, of course, this very sad story of destruction. Uh, and even while writing it, uh, you know, blood used to boil, and you would uh, empathize with me. It's so difficult to keep an emotional distance. Hasan Nizami says in one uh, you know attack that uh, Kutubuddin Aibak made of uh, Kashi 1000 temples were destroyed and the amount of wealth was laden on 18 camels and 300 elephants and taken away and all of that in fact even my translator Prachi uh, she used to call me saying i'm getting so angry so agitated just to read the raw material the the rawness of that violence that we have endured uh, over so many uh, centuries एक तो वो था दैट वॉज वन ट्रैक इट द प्लेस ऑल द टाइम फेस्ड मल्टीपल आइकोनोक्लास्टिक वेव्स वेव्स ऑफ ब्रेकेज एंड डिस्ट्रक्शन वी थिंक ओनली औरंगजेब ही वॉज द लास्ट इन द एंटायर यू नो कंटिन्यूम बट द फर्स्ट अटैक वॉज मेड इन लेवन नाइन्टी फोर बाई कुतुबुद्दीन ऐबक वेर द होल ऑफ काशी वॉज डिमोलिश्ड द नेक्स्ट वॉज रजिया सुल्तान हु इन जस्ट द फोर इयर्स दैट शी रूल शी गॉट द टाइम टू गो एंड इवन बिल्ड अ मस्जिद देर विच इज स्टिल देर कॉल द रजिया मॉस्क and we only eulogize her as hema malini and you know the dharmendra love story of the film we don't know the other side of razia sultan uh, and then 1330s you had the jaunpur sharki nawabs who again demolished lot of temples there and took away many of these structures to other uh, you know uh, mosques in other parts of uh, northern india then you had the Khil- uh, khiljis and finally sikandar lodi who in around 1494 95 the whole of kashi was completely uh you know in ruins for almost 80 90 years now this is one sad story which we can keep talking about but the other story which is important is one of hope one of resurrection that we never gave up on that side come what may and why was that because as was mentioned in the introduction and in the uh, promo that uh, you know this place was so important because bhagwan shiv himself had you know assured everybody that if you die in this particular place you are assured of moksha and moksha nirvana is something that is quintessential uh, yearning of all the uh, dharmic faiths in india whether it is buddhism hinduism jainism whichever uh, and when you are getting this lottery ticket that waha maroge to seedha and shiv ji himself will come and once the soul leaves the mortal coils he's he's going to whisper tarak ram mantra in the ears of the soul so that it goes straight to heaven the ultimate uh, shortcut ultimate shortcut yeah yeah fast track yeah. so <laughs> so uh, that is one reason everybody wanted to go there uh, and not only uh, you know the royalties and royal houses even common people uh, prachi again told me a very interesting marathi proverb in uh, you know which is prevalent apparently kashis jave nitya vadave Uh, this in houses people would say saying let us go to kashi that is an aspiration almost uh, let's keep saying it so that at least speech manifestation uh, of the thought happens because it was not so easy to just uh, go to kashi or char dhams or anything so the very fact that we need to go there we need to take our parents there that will give us a lot of punya if you just take your parents and make them do a kashi yatra in south indian weddings there is still this pratha of a kashi yatra just before the bride and bridegroom exchange their varmalas the bridegroom suddenly decides i'm going away to kashi and taking a renunciation from grahast grahasthi and then the bride uh, bride's father bechara he runs behind and then washes his feet and says i'll give you my daughter this is a better option so and then he uh, you know leaves the plan of going to uh, kashi so constantly in human in indian in bharatiya psyche itself kashi and its importance is circumscribed uh, since centuries so the re- uh, resistance that came so 1194 i spoke about um, abax destruction barely 20 years later in 1212 you had from bengal uh, you know a ruler 
Vishwarupa of the Sena dynasty coming there hardly 20 years later and putting, erecting a pillar, a Vijaya's thumb right in the center of Kashi saying this is the city of Vishweshwar. So stamping authority so to say. Didn't have the wherewithal to build uh, you know, an entire temple because the Delhi Sultanate was at its peak. A few years later, 1240, 1250, you had a uh, businessman from Gujarat called Seth Vastupal who gave 1 lakh rupees in those days to rebuild this temple. And the grand temple had come in within 40, 50 years. And from South India, from my state, Karnataka, you had the Hoysala ruler, Veera Narasimha III, who donated an entire village called Hebale uh, so that the proceeds of money that would come from this village will go at, uh, for the pilgrims to pay their jizya tax. So those, uh, the Hindus to go and visit your own temples, you had to pay a tax to the Sultanate. Uh, in my state, even now, there is some tax on uh, temples, which is still collected. But uh, those days, it was a very, uh, you know, strong, uh, heavy tax that had to be paid. So this man gives an entire village, and there's a Shila Lake, which clearly mentions all this money I give away uh, to the lotus feet of Vishweshwar. Uh, so today we talk of north, south, we are all different, we are not, not even a nation, the British did, gave us a sense of nationality. What was this? Where, what, it, what was it for, to a Bengali ruler, a Karnataka ruler, or a Gujarati businessman? He didn't say that is Uttar Pradesh, Mujhe kya farak padta hai, lena dena nahi hai, it's some other language, some other culture. They all felt that common sense of connect and also a sense of, uh, you know, emotional, uh, you know, civilizational connect and that is what makes a nation, not political borders, not codification of uh, sterile laws and rules, which are important to run a nation, but a nation is much beyond that. Uh, you, the EU has shown just making some maps on a piece of paper will not give you emotional connect. Uh, so India, Bharat has always been and the heart was beating for some of these primal spots. And that is why today when we say we want some of these back, these do not become conversations of today. Uh, political parties and politicians will of course use it either way. Uh, it is because it's so deeply connected to people's aspirations. So they have a right also to represent our wishes. Some would represent the wishes of those opposing the temple. Some would represent the causes of those, uh, you know, espousing the cause of the temple. But for all of us, a majority of us who don't belong to political parties, I think it's a larger civilizational issue. And on that, as I said earlier, since our ancestors never gave up on it, so we have no right to say, let's give it up, let's build one school, hospital, the usual tropes that are uh, told whenever these sacred spots are up for a reclaim. But I just want to add because... He said politicians don't give up, but whatever we have written that this will be our Pehchan Patra and we will be saying that in coming time Ram Temple will be built. We did build it. So that's very important that it's not only belief or aspiration of people. Shiv is ish. Shiv is all belief inside us. Um, when I was young, my mother is a very strong devout, uh, devout Hindu and practicing Hindu. There were a lot of you know pluses and minuses in that. But my father always used to tell me stories about Shiv that Shiv asa deva hai, to rakshasansa pan deva hai, ani to devan sahi deva hai. That connect, that cultural connect, we always had that. And that's why Shiv cannot be forgotten. I Paap bhi kiya, to mujhe Shiv hi bachayenge. I have done kiya, to Shiv ji mujhe VVIP ticket deke bhej denge upar. So that's what actually it's all about. And I hope Shiv also gives me VVIP ticket in coming time. So we work on that. <laughs> so I want to read something. We feel good, nahi. Thoda feel bad. Karte. Um, this is from your book. I, I'll start. I want your reaction to something like this. This is written by Inayatullah Khan, uh, who appointed uh, Saki Mushtayat Khan to chronicle Aurangzeb's reign. My favorite Mughal. I'm being sarcastic. Seriously, I don't know. So it's written over here in the Masai Ralamgiri. On the 17th Zeel Qada, 1079, it reached the ear of His Majesty, the protector of the faith, that in the provinces of Thatta, Multan and Banaras, but especially in the latter, that is Banaras, foolish Brahmins were in the habit of expounding frivolous books in their schools and that the students and learners, now this is the key here, Muslims as well as Hindus, 
that's a very important bit that we should keep in our mind. Went there even from long distances, led by a desire to become, become acquainted with the wicked sciences they taught. The director of faith consequently issued orders to all the governors of provinces to destroy with a willing hand the schools and temples of the infidels. And they were strictly enjoined to put an entire stop to the teaching and practicing of idolatrous forms of worship. Hanji Maharaj, what did you No, so you want a reaction. No, I want to understand that... To, no, no, I want to understand that how do we deal with this? See, the... the today. Okay. Kushal, look. Uh, the pattern which, uh, which Vikram is talking about, just go back into Somnath also. You start with Al Junaid. Then it goes on to Ghazni, then it goes on to your uh, uh, Mahmud uh, Begada, uh, then uh, uh, it eventually ends up with Aurangzeb. But there are at least seven or eight destructions. Let's not focus on the destructions, focus on the fact that we sprung back each time. We again rebuilt and that's the fundamental resilience of Sanatan culture, Sanatan Dharma. See, uh, I mean, okay, uh, let me put it this way. The way I see it is that Sanatan Dharm is that perfect example of a no formula faith. Uh, for someone, I'm sitting with you right now, you very proudly I am talk a proud about Hindu. the fact, but you also talk proudly about the fact that you are an atheist. And the way I see it is that it is only in Sanatan that you can be astic, you can be nastic, you can be spiritualistic, you can be ritualistic or simply fantastic. It doesn't matter. All of them are welcome. You can be a Shaivite or a Vaishnavite. You can believe in Shakti or you can believe in Bhakti. You may call the Shivling a stone and I can call the stone a Shivling. All of us are welcome. Uh, I can keep, I can make Buddha into the ninth avatar of Vishnu. I can keep a Murti of Jesus Christ or Mahavir or Guru Nanak in my puja and I will still bow my head because I see them all as paths to the divine. That is the amazing bit of, you can have 33 kotis of deities, you can worship in a, uh, in a, in a graveyard, you can worship in a temple, in, in your puja, uh, you can worship a mountain, you can worship the sun. Uh, the point I'm making is that this is all encompassing, all absorbing. And that is the reason why, just look around you at the world, ancient civilizations. Where, is, where are the Mithraic cults of Rome? Uh, where are uh, Horus and Ra of the Egyptians? Uh, where are the Incan and Mayan deities? Uh, where is Zoroastrianism in Iran? Where is the abo aboriginal uh, belief system of Australia? All of them vanished because they could not take on the Abrahamic onslaught. And so there is something to be said for Sanatan culture, that we survived against all odds. We bounced back. I think that is the story that we should be talking about. That's exactly about. what I wanted from you because uh, every time I travel outside India, the line I hear is, uh, it's very interesting. I, I once said this uh, in a atheist for uh, forum. Uh, I, it was very interesting conversation and I told them, I was like, for you guys, the only good pagan is a dead pagan. <laughs> a dead pagan that you can put in a museum and be like, ah, yaar, ye log aise mast hote the, re, sab aisa karte the, aisa karte the. So they, when, when I told them that you just are not used to the reality that there are some of us who talk back. <laughs> right. Some of us who talk back in different fields, whether it's through writing, through politics, or through podcasting, some of us talk back. Now you, who's, who's writing about all of this history, how do, how do we, okay, everybody will buy the book, but how do we articulate what's written? That, that's been my grouse, how many times have I told you? How do we articulate the message today? Tell them. That's that's very difficult. <laughs> that's a very difficult question. <laughs> I'll, I'll get to that, but I forgot something very important. And uh, considering we are in Maharashtra and in Mumbai, you of course started with Ahilya Bai Holkar. But the very fact that this was, she was the last in the chain even of the Maratha history, 
to, for reclamation particularly of Kashi Vishwanath. You had, when Vishwanath Mandir was broken in 1669, Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj was alive. Uh, and his mother, Mata Jijabai, is supposed to have been so angry with him and with the whole fact. And she told him that if you are man enough, the goal of your life should be the reclamation of this temple. And Shekhar Senji, uh, who's sitting here, he sent me a little uh, Marathi, uh, you know, uh, piece, which said while Shivaji Maharaj was about to, you know, leave his mortal coil, uh, they were telling him that, you know, have a happy prasthan from here. And in Marathi, he's supposed to have said, how can I be happy when Kashi Vishwanath is still in captivity? And so the underlying theme of the uh, Maratha Samrajya itself later on became a reclamation of not only this, but a few other important sites. So in the book, I also quote the documents of the Peshwas uh, from the Peshwa Daftar, right from Baji Rao the first to Nana Sahib Peshwa. They're constantly negotiating, saying, give us these sites back, Ayodhya, Kashi, Mathura, Prayag, Gaya. These were all under the control of the Mughals. Then it moved on to the Awadh Nawabs and then the East India Company. So constantly they are saying, give these sites to us back in return for ABCD. Now, Madhav Rao Peshwa, the first, um, someone so celebrated, who lived only for 26, 27 years and rebuilt the empire after the Battle of Panipat and the debacle there, he, just before dying, his will, there are three points which relate to Kashi. And, you know, one is about, I'll give this grants to some pandas and all that. One, that my mother should go there and she should spend her last days. But the third important uh, point of his will was it is the duty of all my successors, I give them this duty to liberate Kashi Vishwanath. Wow. So, uh, and you know, Nana Fadnavis, in the heights of the third Anglo-Mysore war, uh, they're dis discussing with Cornwallis whether we'll support you against Tipu Sultan. And one of the clauses for uh, this is, we will support you if you give us back Kashi, Ayodhya, Mathura, all these places. And of course the British uh, refuse, but constantly that, Consciousness was there. And Malhar Rao Holkar, Ahilya Bai's father-in-law, takes an entire army to go and demolish the Gyan Vapi Masjid uh, and liberate the place. But the Brahmins of Kashi said, don't do this. Uh, you know, uh, you will destroy and go away, but then we will have to face the brunt. So let it be. Uh, we'll, we'll find another way. But just as they were doing all this, there is another wave of iconoclasm, which I didn't know of. I suddenly came to know about this. In 1755, whatever little shrine had come up, that also gets demolished by a local Kazi. Um, and then the guru of the Peshwas, uh, Narayan Dikshit Patankar, he goes on a fast unto death, saying, uh, this is the limit. You know, our, after so much of uh, trouble, we've got the shrine back and that was also destroyed. And the Peshwa had to go all the way there and convince him to give up his fast and so on. So you can see, and then the final thing, Ahilya Bhai Holkar was a very astute, uh, you know, uh, ruler. She didn't take the confrontationist route. She, through soft power, she tried to negotiate with even uh, Nawabs of Bhopal and Hyderabad and all of that to, through goodwill, she tried to establish all these temples back, whether it was Somnath or Kashi Vishwanath, all the, uh, you know, uh, 12 Jyotirlingas, the seven dhams, the, all of that, the uh, seven Puris and the char dhams. So she uh, did something which all these others could not do through brute force. So I think there was this continuous link again uh, as a follow-up of what I said earlier, especially in Maharashtra. And to talk about that in this city, I think therefore becomes all the more, uh, you know, appropriate and important. That's why I said, uh, before starting only, the foundation of Hindavi Swarajya by Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj. You always believe any political party or any organization has its thought process, its ideology. I think Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj's ideology and thought process was so clear that generations later, with Chau Maharaj, then it came to Peshwas, then their Sardars all over, and of course, Holkars, it was clearer. But I always feel when you talk about uh, positivity towards Sanatan Dharma, we must tell our Gen Zs and Gen Alphas coming in time the kind of suffering we also went through. Jab tak dard kya hua hai, laga kya hai, pata nahi chalega, to pata kaise chalega ki humne kya jindagi ji hai. Like I always tell my son what my father had seen. So it's always a legacy to tell them the pain and the achievements. And somewhere I feel we are such amazing Sahishnu Hindus, always being saying, hum to ladenge, aage jayenge, we will find a better way step by step. But somehow this invasion and destruction, see I studied in a Marathi medium school, 
surrounded by Marathi people, Shivaji Maharaj, Hindavi Swaraj. It was always inside me. It was us discussing this with our Marathi friends. But is it in English speaking students who discuss this? So I think this book, to decode this book, I don't know, I'm too small for this in front of Dr. Sampath. But I think decoding this book will be only talking to that generation about the invasion. What we have done and how many Sahishnu hai, kitane takatwar hai, ye sahaki bhi humne. We kept on moving and kept our belief in Hindutva. And that's why now, even this book 10 years before, I don't think would have been liked. Ab tak to bahar jalti rehti. Baat sach hai ki nahi. Maaf kari hai. I'm not making it more politically. Lekin ye kitab 10 ya 12 saal pehle aati, to pakka bahari hotel ke bahar 10-15 jalti aur yaan pe andar polis hoti. So it's all about how ideology takes it over. Not as a politician, but I believe because I have seen this. Maybe I also failed as a mother telling my two children that invasion was real and what we suffered as Indians, what our culture suffered. We should have actually worked on it and discussed it. I think in our educational part also, I believe we discussed quite a lot on this, that we must tell. You see any European country, any country in Western region, they always talk about their pain their destruction, and then how they rise from that destruction. I think that also has to be told to our children, to our future generations. I think that's the decoding we need. Just a, a sm a taking off from what Poonam ji said, uh, to my mind, there are a bunch of kids who have grown up thinking that India starts in 1947. And... Uh, in 47, we sir. You, you know, uh, Kushal, the truth of the matter is that uh, when, you, when you think about this, uh, 1947, and then of course by the time that you adopt the constitution, uh, the word secular does not figure in the preamble. Hanji. Comes in 1976. Hanji. So the question that sometimes people like me ask ourselves is that, was the omission of that word did it make us into a Hindu Rashtra during those initial 20 or 25 odd years when the word secular was not there? And the answer is a resounding no. So in other words, why was it omitted at that point of time? And the way I see it is that the framers of our constitution understood that this is a country where because of the fact that this has a underlying Hindu ethos, everyone will be absorbed. Whether it is, whether we absorb the Zoroastrians from Persia, or whether it was the St. Thomas Christians, or whether it was the Bene Israel, or the Baghdadi Jews, or the Buddhists who came from uh, 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 when uh, Tibet was invaded. We've absorbed everyone. Uh, the point is simply this, that the reason we had that capacity to absorb is because of the underlying civilizational ethos. And you know, nowadays Hindutva is a very charged word, but the truth of the matter is that all I see Hindutva as is the ability to be able to rise above your culture, creed, religion, language, and become one with your civilizational identity. And that is where I think to a certain extent our kids are a little unaware. Uh, so one has to make a conscious effort because schools are not doing that. Uh, I know this discussion is going slightly away, but schools are not doing that. We as parents need to be actually inculcating those values in terms of civilizational pride. See, his surname is only Sanghi. So yeah, Ratanji is sitting here. So I say that I am an honorary uh, Sanghi because from day one my name was, uh, you know, Ashwin Sanghi. So actually the surname is pronounced Sanghi but everyone calls me Sanghi. So it's okay. <laughs> uh, that is Sanghi. So... Sorry, I'm just adding to it because of our ideology and our thought process when you talk about Hindu ethos, even culturally, scientifically, how you look at it. You must be knowing about the excursion of Sinoli. Yes. And that actually opened eyes to the Western world that we could find who actually had the wheel. And I mean, everything is coming back to India. Maybe it's the right time 
as you say, it was more of a Shah Rukh Khan's line, <laughs> but you said, you, everything conspired for you. They use it in some Hindi movie ki tumhe paane ke liye. Kainat aapke liye. Kainat aapke So, I'm not putting it in a very Urdu manner. But that... I think it was lifted from alchemy. Ah. Yes, of course. Something has to be lifted in Hindi movies. Yeah, so... Sorry, I, I mean, I, I didn't mean to I say would, that. I would like to, in fact, ask Mr. Sampath, Dr. Sampath... Doctor. Uh, ...in terms of this latest movie that has come out uh, on Veer Savarkar and what he, what he feels about, about that. <laughs> Why are you putting me in this spot? <laughs> no, no, it's fun. Do it, do it. You should say, I haven't seen it. I haven't yet seen it. I have I seen it. I have. I have seen it. No, it was in the that. context of the fact that the alchemy quote had been lifted. It huh. was in that context. But that very importantly, the book has to be read. It's, it's just, it's, again, I'm coming back to the book. And I really, really love it. Savarkar, I'm sorry, we have to read Waiting for Shiva. But before that, Savarkar... Uh, is a must. Made, yes. Yeah, yes, you yes. should read that book. Because even while coming over here, we were in the car, we were talking about the, the book and the importance. And, and just on the word Hindutva, can I say this? Uh, just own the word. If, if somebody uses that word as a pejorative to put you down, uh, the best way to explain it was by my friend Harsh Madhusudan Gupta who once told me that you know if they want to make Hindutva the n-word then I own it. I own it, yes. I, I, I don't shy away from it. I own it. You, you think you're going to use that as a pejorative? Go ahead, use it hundred times. It's a badge of honor. I am a Hindutva Vadi. I don't apologize for it. I will not. Before we maybe open it to the audience, I'd like to say, uh, especially in this case, now in Ayodhya, we just had the entire Pran Pratishtha and the, after so many years of uh, struggle. In this case, it's an open and shut case. Hath uh, Kangan ko RC kya? You know, you just go there and see the western walls. Uh, there are pictures in the book too. The entire western walls are the ruins of a 16th century temple. Uh, and look at the mindset too. Uh, of the uh, man who demolished it. He could have demolished the whole, uh, you know, temple and built a very grand mosque in its place. But purposely, only the shikharas were removed and in its place, three gumbads were placed and it was declared a masjid from that day. So that daily, the devout in Kashi go there, they see their most sacred Jyotirlinga being in this uh, condition and the amount of humiliation and insult that, that they must have faced on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was the entire idea. Uh, now, where is the evidence? Where is the evidence? This is constantly, it was thrown in the case of… Uh, Here is the evidence. Yeah, this is one evidence. There are 800 pages of the Archaeological Survey of India, which uh, just came out two months back, if you haven't read it. Uh, excerpts of that are there in the book, but the entire yeah. report is there, I think, online. Yeah, yeah it is. Uh, and if you see, I mean, all uh, the, the latest of technologies have been used, GPR, ground penetrating radar, uh, differential uh, positioning systems, uh, handheld x-ray spectrometer techniques, all that to show what are the substructures, uh, what is the dating, what is the inscription. The inscriptions were found right from the 12th century till the 17th century. And not only, only in uh, Devanagari or Sanskrit, but also in Tamil, in Telugu, in Kannada, which reinforces the fact that this was so important for uh, people all over India. Uh, there are 800 pages and pages and pages of evidence, but still uh, and there are Khandit Murtis, uh, lots and lots of them. But despite that, if one says, I will not agree. And, you know, f and fabrication of history, for me, that, uh, you know, uh, upsets me the most. Not only upsets me, it enrages me. The kind of fabrication that is done to deny what is obvious. Uh, in the case of Kashi Vishwanath Ru, in several uh, platforms, including yours, I've spoken uh, about this, but for the benefit of some of the others, I must mention uh, the alibis that were served to give cover fire for Aurangzeb. Uh, there's a fascinating story uh, which was, you know, spun around during the, uh, you know, decades after independence by this man called Dr. Bishambar Nath Pandey. He was a very celebrated Congress leader who also was a uh, scholar and so on. And he, um, you know, was the governor of Odisha, several places. 
and this man uh, writes a paper in um, Islamic culture in India or something and in that there is this story of why Kashi Vishwanath Mandir was demolished and I'll narrate this beautiful fairy tale uh, also you know putting loopholes of logic common sense and logic forget Hindutva is that all this thing set aside just logic now um, according to this story of uh, Pandeji so the entire entourage Aurangzeb is going to Bengal with an entire entourage loophole number one in all the documented biographies of Aurangzeb he never went to Bengal himself <laughs> he only sent his commanders uh, but he never went personally but chalo it's okay small liberties poetic you know liberties you can take uh, and so he went now he didn't go alone he goes along with uh, an entourage of Hindu Rajas and also their wives uh, which is again very uh, odd now the, the crossing from Agra, you have to go to Bengal, you cross Varanasi on the way and all the Hindu Rajas go to him and say, Jahapana, this is such a great place, you know, very sacred to us. Can we stay back uh, for the night here? Now being the very generous, you know, golden hearted, secular ruler that he was made, <laughs> made to, we are made to believe, he says, okay, chalo, kuch karte hain, aaj raat ko yahi reh jate hain. And then uh, you go and you do your puja and all that. And the third loophole. Now the Rajas who asked for permission, they don't go to worship, they send their Ranis, okay? And the fourth loophole, the Ranis of Rajput Riyasats, they don't go with security guards, they go just by themselves. And then so the, all the Ranis go, they take a dip in the Ganga, they go and worship and this, that, and they come back. And then there's a head count that is done and one Rani is supposed to be missing, the Rani of Kutch. Now, all the soldiers are, you know, flustered and then Aurangzeb is enraged. How could someone from my entourage be missing? And so he sends his, uh, you know, uh, soldiers to go and look for her. Now, typical 1950, you know, Bollywood films of those times, you, uh, these people go there and there is a sliding wall in the Vishwanath Mandir. There's a Ganesh Ji ki Murti, the soldiers just touch it and this wall just slides. And there's a flight of stairs which goes to the Tehkhana, the cellar. And that is right below the Garbhagraha of Vishveshwar. And there is Rani sitting, you know, without clothes, without ornaments, wailing and weeping. And when they ask her the reason, she says, you know, the, the Brahmin priests of the temple. There had to be a Brahmin angle, no? Had to be one. <laughs> Panditji, who is always bad and conniving, along with Thakur Saab. <laughs> So, <laughs> so uh, she says, oh, the Brahmin priests, they routinely do this, you know, uh, all the, uh, this ones, you know, wealthy pilgrims who come, they are molested and um, uh, robbed like this. And the Rajas get so enraged and the Rani themselves, they all tell Aurangzeb, this is a place of Saturn, just destroy, destroy it. it. And Aurangzeb just did not want to do it. So, so much pressure, chalo, ek dhakka aur do, isko gira do. And he d supposedly demolished the Kashi Vishwanath Mandir. But where were, which Rani was molested in Mathura, in Thatta? The Brahman demolished it, that's what he was trying to say. Was, yeah, there's so many subtexts to that. Now, in history, everything needs a source. So, where is the source of Pandeji's fairy tale? You go back and there is a 1930s uh, Pattabhi Sita Ramaya, a president of the Congress and also a historian of the Congress party. He writes in a book uh, about this story. And look at the subterfuge, the kind of, uh, you know, lies that were spun, you know, your blood boils. He says, I had a friend uh, who knew a certain mullah in Lucknow who had a very rare manuscript in which this story was told. Now, my friend was to introduce me to that mullah and get me that manuscript. But who died? Mullah, uh, either mullah or the friend, somebody died. I haven't seen the manuscript. But this is a widely known story about why Vishwanath Mandir was demolished. Now, unknown mullah, unnamed manuscript, unknown friend. Now, this becomes source. And that is how history is manipulated, where one person needs to plant a false story. Then someone else will quote me. Then someone else will quote the two of us. It's a circular referencing mafia of sorts. We just start and then you repeat a lie a hundred times. It starts assuming the edifice of truth. And so this is the sad story uh, in this case as so many others, including now, when the case was gathering so much momentum, you had someone of the eminence of uh, Irfan Habib come on uh, a social media channel, I think the Quint, and say, of, at least now he admitted that uh, mandir to toda gaya tha, Aurangzeb ne toda tha, par Shivji ka mandir tha ya nahi pata nahi hai. Achha. You know, the, the Masire Alamgiri, which is a contemporary chronicle, itself says, uh, you read the first part, which was in April 1669, 
And in September 1669, the soldiers write back saying, Badshah, as per your farman, we have demolished all the temples, including the temple of Bishnath, the upper branch of Vishwanath as Bishnath. Now, what more you need as a proof? But that is not a proof. Uh, no, Saki Mustaid Khan exaggerates, I think that is not uh, correct, and all these stories. But that Anne Mullah, his story, his uh, some friend, all that is gospel truth. And in fact, someone else, uh, you know, gave me a very interesting, again, it has a Maharashtra connection. I think it was N.C. Gore, uh, who met, uh, this is uh, Gajendra Mahendale, Gajabhav Mahendale, who's a very famous historian in Pune, who said N.C. Gore actually told him that Pattabhi Sita Ramaya. We can also say he told, she told and all that, right? I mean, that's part of historical research anyway. So Gore told him that it was actually uh, at Gandhiji's insistence, Pattabhi Sita Ramaya said, I, I had to make a lot of effort to create a Hindu-Muslim unity so that bad blood does not uh, come between communities. So, you know, fabricated history can last till archaeology comes to the place. And I think that is why archaeological surveys, archaeological excavations are opposed all the time. You can make up all these fairy tales, but what do you do when this proof comes, no? when all those murtis are coming? Even for that, I'm told that the new thing is, it was a uh, murti banane ka workshop. <laughs> that place was a uh, murti manufacture workshop. That is why you find, uh, you know, uh, broken idols. Uh, then there are other stories that this is not a temple, it was actually uh, Akbar's, uh, you know, dinne ilahi ibadat khana, no proof of that, no source to say Akbar built a ibadat khana in Kashi uh, at this site. Some say it's a Dara Shikoka, Sanskrit ka patshala. So everything other than this, everything other than, uh, you know, telling the truth as it is, itihasa means it thus happened. Uh, so saying the truth as it is, usko chhod ke sab ghuma ghuma ke and giving cover fire for the most bigoted, uh, you know, activities of some of these people. And the same people also say, you know, communities today are not responsible for the atrocities. And that is true. I totally agree with that. Yeah. Communities of today are not responsible for Ghazni, Ghori, Aurangzeb, Tipu Sultan, all these people. But the converse also needs to then be true that Communities of today should not be identified with these barbarians and invaders. And to make people today feel secure and happy or whatever, you don't have to whitewash and remove, uh, you know, true elements from our history. So I think the time has now come uh, to finally, I think, look truth in the eye, how much ever uncomfortable it may be for whoever. But this subterfuge that is being played, these fairy tales that are spun, they're told to us like bedtime stories that we will pass on these stories to generations after us. Uh, even today when Vishnu, Ji, uh, Vishnu Jain goes on television channels, Hindi channels and all that, this uh, Kach Rani story is cited by some of the opponents on the debates, saying, oh, to, you know, it was, there was a reason, it was a bad place, there were lots of bad activities happening. Hare, what is your problem? This is, you know, you don't have to uh, give justice to uh, what is happening in that um, our place of worship. So I think the both archaeology, you also ask how should this be transmitted to people. I think just saying the truth sometimes, truth is the best antidote. I think uh, it is the biggest disinfectant uh, after light. So I think it, uh, the true facts need to come out for everybody's consumption. So, we can start the Q&A, but this charcha ka nishkarsh ye nikla ki uh, eminent historians ka source hai, trust me bro. Uh, that, that is their source, trust me bro. So, uh, uske upar dhyan dijega. And uh, if uh, somebody next time asks you, uh, uh, this book is the answer of, uh, uh, and you hold this book and show that person and always remember this line, this pagan refuses to die. I have two questions. Uh, first one, it's based on my understanding of uh, whatever I've read in the book. We moved from worshipping Avimukteshwara to Vishweshwara. And the meaning of Avimukteshwara is one who doesn't forsake. So, my understanding, again, I may be wrong, is it because we moved from worshipping Avimukteshwara to Vishweshwara, Avimukteshwara forsake us, the place? <laughs> and second one, uh, in all the... Uh, discussions and also the uh, the ASI survey that took place. At least I did not find uh, the 
the survey at Razia Mosque, which is actually one of the original sites that was destructed and, uh, and the mosque built. So are we also trying to reclaim that? Because whenever it happens like the Ramjan Mubumi, yeah. that should be one of the places where the temple will come up. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a very technical question. I'll quickly, uh, because be only once you read the uh, context of the book, it will become more uh, relevant. Uh, so there were two shivlings which were very important in Kashi. One was Vishweshwar and the other was Avi Mukteshwar. And even the Skanda Puran, uh, where Bhagwan Shiv himself says, there are 14 lingas in Kashi which are very, very important. Out, uh, and each part, it's like a lingatmak swaroop of a human anatomy. So there's Omkareshwar on the head, then Trilochan on the eyes. So different parts of the body. And the two right hands are Vishweshwar and Avi Mukteshwar. And the same Skanda Puran also mentions that while the whole world worships Vishweshwar, Vishweshwar worships Avi Mukteshwar, who is his guru. So the senior linga. So obviously at some point, uh, I think this Avi Mukteshwar was more uh, predominantly worshipped there. But there are also records to show that Avi Mukteshwar was for a very elite class of uh, worshippers, whereas Vishweshwar did not have Sparsha Dosh. So everybody could go touch him and do Abhishek and all that and worship him. So uh, maybe that was one reason it became more popular. Now when Abak's uh, sword uh, fell on Kashi, Naturally, that time Avi Mukteshwar was completely destroyed. And in places, in cases like this, where there are multiple series of destructions, the transpositions from the original location or within that radius, it becomes inevitable. So the common belief is that where the Razia Mosque stands today, that is the spot of the original Vishweshwar Mandir. Uh, and so to commemorate that, the uh, ruler of Jaipur, uh, Savai Jai Singh, uh, he actually got an Adi Vishweshwar Mandir, Adi meaning the original, actually built just on the borders of the Razia Mosque. Uh, and so, um, but then there are no records, there are no records, there's no inscription, nothing to say that this was the original spot. Uh, maybe there are some records in the Jaipur archives, I have tried my best in the Bikaner archives, in the Jaipur archives, not found so far. So, they, uh, but on the reclamation drive of um, the, that spot, I think there is a case going on even in that and our dear friend Sai Deepak is actually representing that case uh, with, on behalf of the Banaras uh, Raja, the, the, the royal family of uh, Banaras saying that spot is also something that we want. So, and there's that way there's also Beni Madhav, uh, the Bindu Madhav temple which is uh, important which also has been taken over. So, there are several such uh, this one. Vikram, but when, uh, you, you mentioned in the book that the entire complex was like a yantra. Yes. So I'm assuming that there are multiple points along that yantra, yeah. which would be worthy of research, right? Correct. So Kashi itself, they say it's not just the, the nucleus of this uh, entire thing is Vishweshwar. For the last thousand years, once Avi Mukteshwar's uh, you know, importance started declining, at least since the 13th century, we've had Vishweshwar reigning supreme, but all the others are spatially distributed uh, in a particular geography. Uh, and the Puranas, they very clearly say, you go so many coasts uh, to the right, then you find Tarkeshwar. Then you go take a left turn, you find this one. Then you go here, you find that one. So they all together create an energy field, so to say, which gives the place its, uh, you know, whatever, uh, spiritual power. Uh, so it is not just one thing, the entire complex, according to the literature available, there is documented evidence of how the distribution of the deities uh, happens there. No, sir, I think, I think we should we stick should to one question per ask, person. Please. Ask two already. Yes, sir. <laughs> please, one question only. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, so it's not a buy one, get one free. <laughs> Hi, so uh, my question is, we come from a place where, you know, we are in Maharashtra and uh, we've seen the reconstruction of Tulja Bhavani or we've seen uh, Chhatrapati Maharaj's reconstruction of Thiruvannana Malai. Uh, and on the same terms, we see people uh, who think of themselves as custodians of the society, uh, who then say that our uh, attempts will only be limited to these three spots, that is Ayodhya, Mathura and Kashi. What would you say to that? And what do you see as the greatest challenge in terms of POWA, that is Places of Worship Act, which is the biggest thing that is thrown in the face of, you know, part history, part you, politics. Who do you want the answer from? The, the politician, the lawmaker, P -O or the P -O commentator? W or the liar. And uh, the other spots. I hope it's not turning here. I think you should be answering. He's asking. Okay. 
acha okay uh, so um, again you're putting me on a spot here because i am not a votary of that fact that just three are important uh, like who decides only three are important right uh, suppose and in in the hindu tradition there's some there's a concept of kula devata so suppose somebody in kerala or somewhere else assam or somewhere there is a there is a very important temple uh, which has been destroyed and incidentally all these three kashi mathura ayodhya are in uttar pradesh so very very you know north centric very i mean the, the claims come from there right now though the spots have been sacred all over the country for the centuries but many other parts of india may have uh you know uh, important they may have their emotions to it so i think the important rule to apply is has there been continuous worship in these uh, spots uh, is there a copious amount of literature uh, or archaeological evidence historical evidence about its sanctity did our ancestors fight for it and they did not give up on it uh, and if that rule uh, comes into place then i don't think anyone i mean in any decent uh, society if i come and occupy your house and i tell you that you don't even have the legal recourse to take me to court in a peaceful manner you know taking a violent mob or something to beat me up but even debarring you from going peacefully to court and taking back your lawful property i don't think it happens in any civilized country so uh, i'm for one uh, not a legal expert so this places of worship act which i think was literally uh, sh uh, you know driven through when the opposition bjp at that time in 91 was uh, not even ready for the discussion and they literally pushed it down the throats but there to legal experts say there are certain clauses which are escape routes and narsimha rao being narsimha rao must have thought of all this while drafting that law uh, there is clause 4 uh, uh, section 4 part 2 or something which says this doesn't apply to places uh, which are more than 100 years if it's a heritage monument uh, so the only thing to prove is that spot is more than 100 years uh, then the places of worship act naturally does not apply in those particular cases uh, so even if there is you know the law uh, lawyers and economists i think they can argue on both sides the gdp can be growing also the country might be in a miserable state also both things are done with so much of uh, passion that both seems very plausible similarly lawyers can fight both sides so i'm sure there these loopholes in the law uh, while the i hope the government at least in the next term repeals this act uh, you know whole and square but even while keeping it and that is why this case this went to the civil court this went to the district court it went to the allahabad high court it went to the supreme court uh, with the other side constantly saying this is barred by places of worship act but right from the chief justice of india downwards everyone said this is not barred by the places of worship act though uh you know this is uh, because of this clause and as i said this place was constantly under contestation and in the british era uh, cases that i've documented also uh, very clearly british courts have adjudicated that this was not a waqf property uh, this was not even a masjid and so on so the, there's lots of details about the court uh, things which i won't bore you with so i think each case is very important but what is uh, i think primal for the votaries of the temple not go only for rhetoric not go only for yeah yeah we want we, uh, there are various numbers uh, you know doing the round sitaram goel ji i think has come up with uh, 1860 62 uh, temples and that also he says is the tip of the iceberg there is a huge this thing so but this is Ten times of that yeah it could be uh, so uh, this is one figure some say 20000 some say 40000 but first thing that the hindu side also needs to do is to make a list do some hard work we don't work hard there is a lot of research to be done it's a work of historians and archaeologists to sit and say what are the places which are important what is our catalog tomorrow even if you go to court if you go to negotiate with someone the other side is ask, going to ask you okay tell us what are the uh, sites you want right now we don't have we just talking in social media on podcasts which are instigated by some people like this uh, who for their uh, viewership they'll ask all these difficult questions and people fall prey to that and say yeah, yeah we want all the 40000 temples back very nice we want all of them back but which are the 40000 can you name those 40000 we don't have a uh, you know list of that so first get down to the field dirty your hands uh create that list prioritize in that and then negotiate and i think a lot of this strategy should not be discussed openly also 
uh, in forums, in podcasts, in social media. It should be quietly done. Two, three years, someone does this work and then keeps all the documents ready. So uh, in, in and I'm already telling what should not be spoken so very clearly by saying what should be done. So Vikram right now is Akshay Kumar pulling someone's hair. Zor, zor se bol ke sabko scheme bata di. We'll take the last question for today. Thank you, uh, Vikram, for a very nice uh, explanation of this whole matter. Uh, my question relates uh, to the dating that has been done. Now, we know, we know that carbon-14 dating can be done on any substance that contains carbon, right? That's wood and things like that. But how is the dating of stone done? can't be done, but I think there's some isotope dating or something that's done, right? I, you are the scientist, sir. I'm not <laughs> Professor Datar. Uh, so, uh, and I'm not an archaeologist either. So, but I think there are methods because uh, uh, now what the new uh, plaint that has gone is that wuzu khana, where uh, the shivling was supposedly came out. There are abundances that you can study, but those are many more, I mean, tens or hundreds of thousands of years. Whereas this is uh, in the region of a few thousand years. Right. So that, that was my question. I didn't know. Right. If you but, know uh, according to the lawyers of the Hindu side, uh, from the, the Jains, the current plaint that they've put or the appeal they've put in the Supreme Court is to allow for the dating of the ah. structure that everybody so believed. Is there, is there any wood there that can be dated? I don't think so. It's okay. only the stone, okay. but still stone also, I think there, is, there are methods to date it, which I'm not aware okay. of as a, not being an archaeologist. But uh, so that also, I mean, it, it was a very fascinating when the advocate commissioner survey uh, happens in the place uh, and the, both sides go there um, and uh, they're prevented from going to the Vazukhana. Now, the Vazukhana is the place where the devout go and wash your feet and rinse your mouth and all that before uh, prayers. Now the, the Jains asked, can we go there and see that also? And they said, you're not going to, we're not going to allow you to go there. And an altercation, all that is recorded in a court uh, you know, document. So it's not a story of one side, it's on the affidavit. Uh, so then once they go there, they say there's something inside we would like to see. And there's water inside. And then the other side says, oh, but there are fishes there and fish will die and so on. They, unfortunately for them, these were Jains. They were more sensitive about, you know, vegetarianism and the life of fishes. So they said, we'll get some oxygen cylinder, we'll put that, we'll ensure the fish live. And after all that, the water level as it came down, the, the structure which looked like the shivling comes up. And uh, everyone, according to the eyewitness, they all raised their hands with Har Har Mahadev. And then you saw what happened, you know, people saying, drilling something on the top of it and saying this is a fountain. Now, there is no suction mechanism there uh, for the fountain to actually operate. So, when we talk of reconciliation, when we talk of national unity and all of that, when somebody knows that there is a very sacred object of another fellow Indian, and despite knowing that daily someone is going and washing your feet on it, then how does reconciliation happen? So I think that is also a very important beyond the dating, beyond the scientific, uh, this one. I think these are also matters of sensitivity for another human being. Forget religion and all that. Just sensitivity. If, if Poonamji doesn't like something and I purposely do that uh, and expect her to not uh, retaliate or react, then I think that is being very, very insensitive to her needs. On the dating issue, just one point. Uh, before we wrap it up, it's very important that we should not make it all about the dating of the uh, the, the the stone, uh, because uh, that's actually a straw man, and we should not fall for it. Uh, when you create scientific evidence, it's by creating a nomological network of cumulative evidence. So it is scriptural. It is uh, dating the brick structure, the layers, the layers. Uh, you have to Tining chip everything down. Also architecture. You can't styles. have it both ways. You say ASI is not allowed to go there and then you say, oh, date batao. So it's a, it's a chit bhi mera, pat bhi mera kind of a situation. So yaha to aap ek kaam karo, humko har cheez ko udar analyze karne do archaeologically. Jo finally ladke humne Ramjan Mubhumi mein kiya and lo and behold the answer was like. Uh, so in this case, uh, the, the entire argument ki usko carbon date karo, jis mein carbon nahi ho, usko carbon date kaise karenge? So there are different ways of uh, finding these evidences and uh, to be very honest, uh, to find the evidence in this case is going to be 1000 times easier than it was in Ramjan Bhubhumi. Professor Datar is one of the 
most leading uh, physicists, nuclear physicists and scientists of our country. So I'm sure uh, that he would have a better answer than... Uh, yeah, my my yeah. point was limited that we should not even give credence to this argument. I think I'd like to counter the statement that you made. There is this shroud, uh, shroud of Turing, which was uh, supposed to be, you know, the times of Jesus and so on. And when scientists dated it, it was found to be, I think, some thousand years. Of the order I know about that. I am a godless heathen. I only have science. Ratanji, I think. And then the last question could be the, the lady there. Yeah, last. Uh, mine is not a question, just a remark. Because the question of only three temples, why not all the temples, has started. Actually, it starts with RSS. And since I have gone through the history and I have been part of that, I would like to clarify. The first resolution by RSS was for Kashi Vishwanath Temple, 1959-61. Then secondly, when we start with the point of only three temples, you look at the strategy. 1984, what was the situation of India? What was the situation of Bharatiya Janata Party? And what was Hindu society in the shape of? So it was a starting point. When you have a starting point, you start with a negotiation point, which people understand easily. So we talked of three temples. Once the genie is out and history is out, everybody is out free to you know, look at every other temple. Like you said, the right evidence, right studies, it can be done. But to blame on something on RSS saying, you are happy on three, you are happy on three, you are happy on three, you are There is a context to that. That's all I wanted to point out. Can I say something, Ratanji? Yes. I, I, no, I am in agreement with him, but my, my worry, and I think I see this as two different sides of the spectrum, I agree with what you are saying, Vikram, that at the end of the day, do your research, make your list, do the required groundwork in order to figure out where, what is the actual number. Is it that Sitaram Goel number or is it 10 times of that number? But the counter to that, which I think all right-minded people should also be thinking about, is that at the end of the day, if we are looking for material, emotional, spiritual progress, if we genuinely want to be looking at ourselves as Vishwaguru, I don't know, and this is a, a doubt I have in my mind, I don't know whether a society that is at war with itself will be able to achieve that. So that worries me. I must tell you honestly, that does worry me, and I think it should worry all of us. No, correct, Ashwin, I think I completely agree with you, because this is, it will cause social strife. But that's why I'm saying this should be a, like a truth and reconciliation commission, a tribunal which maybe the government sets up, where, you know, it's a full and final settlement, saying, okay, this is the final list we have, let's sort this out, each one will be a different case, there is no one case, uh, one size fits all, you know, everything will be very, very uh, particular, but then once and for all, let's make peace with our past, uh, and, you know, not keep, break. our great, great grandchildren also need not be sitting and looking at news reports of ASI going to some other place in Meghalaya or, uh, you know, Telangana or somewhere else. Because history is a loaded weapon for the, uh, I mean, even today you're seeing in the West statues being pulled down. So people are not coming to terms with their own historical past, and we didn't do that in this country. So I think the need of the R is a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which actually talks about, uh, you know, sort of healing those wounds, as it were. Uh, namaskar, everyone. This is Tejaswini Patwardhan. It's wonderful to be here and uh, absorb all the conversation on. I would request one opinion from Vikramji and a question for Poonamji. Thanks to Vikramji, uh, genocide of Chitpavan Brahmins found a mention in Savarkar movie. I belong to the community and this was not mentioned ever anywhere. My uh, question or I would want your opinion on the fact that uh, Savarkarji did seek an alliance with Muslim League, but it was uh, either willfully omitted or uh, you know just not mentioned in the movie, where I, I see Savarkar as a very pragmatic person not rigid, but pragmatic. He wanted uni unity, so if it would, could have been achieved by alliance with Muslim League, so be it. 
why was it omitted from the movie? And my question to uh, Poonam Ji would be... That's a question be, I can't answer. I'm not I, I associated know, I know, with the movie. I, I needed your no, opinion. No, I have nothing to do with the I, movie. I wanted your opinion on it. asked a loaded question <laughs> because of that reason. <laughs> the movie might have taken certain things from my book without my permission or uh, I, I just knowledge, but I have no to seek active your opinion uh, on it. I you know, participation in Absolutely. the film. Absolutely. My question to Poonam Ji would be, we have all been waiting for Shiva, but people at large have been waiting for... Hindu temples to be freed from under government clashes. When would that happen? <laughs> it was bar to ask this question to me, maybe. No. <laughs> but I think this question is a statement itself. I'm requesting you that the government is thinking about it. But, you know, for a secular nation in coming time, uh, what we have to look is, temples cannot be under anybody's control. We do believe in it. I don't think Bharatiya Janta Party believes differently. But uh, everything needs reconciliation, discussion, deliberation for that. I understand. Mandir har kisi ke liye khola rehna chahiye. Lekin who will have the person who will be taking care of these temples? I think that we all need to have deliberation, discussion with the government, with coming times. And it will take time. I think it will be step by step we will be looking. We just start, we just, <laughs> so the manifesto committee has just been uh, made today. So I need to ask the chairman of manifesto, but you can send your recommendation for sure. We're taking everybody's recommendations. And once it's in the manifesto, then you know how we work on it. So, but I will not be commenting more strongly on this because this issue is sensitive, still very important to us. We need deliberation, discussion. We need all historians coming on board and take this forward. And we believe in it that we will find a solution to that too. Thank you. It's election time and obviously Poonam ji can't go the full uh, hog, but she managed to uh, at least touch the issue. But I think it's a I, I don't have such compulsion, so I think I can talk a little more freely. Uh, that, you know, I come from a state... <laughs> That, <laughs> which, is, which is good and very refreshing change. Uh, I come from a state where 300 crores uh, is given in the budget in Karnataka to the uh, Vakf board, 200 crores or so to Christian institutions, and there is 10% tax on Hindu temples which have revenues more than 1 crore. Uh, Hindu temples can have on the board of trustees non-Hindus, uh, whereas I cannot become, or Poonamji cannot become a board of trustee of the Jama Masjid or, you know, uh, St. Francis. You would want to? You wouldn't? You, would, you wouldn't want to. But then our, in Tirupati, we are seeing what's happening on the uh, board, uh, you know, non-Hindus being on uh, this and the repercussions of all of that. Uh, so while, you know, the Western media and the bogies that call, oh, we've become a theocracy, a Hindu Rashtra and all of that, what sort of a Hindu Rashtra is this where... I mean, my dear friend Anand Ranganathan has written an entire book, uh, Hindus in Hindu Rashtra, are eighth class citizens, uh, where we don't get to control our own educational institutions or our temples, uh, none of those. Uh, while, you know, the Vakf board um, is the third largest owner of land in this country after defense and railways. 75% of Delhi land is supposed to be on Vakf property, including the Delhi High Court, the Central Vista, and here, I think Mr. Mukesh Ambani's house is also on Vakf property. So, uh, <laughs> I'm performing tomorrow at NMACC, I better not say much. But, uh, you know, the... <laughs> So, and the thing is the tribunal, the, the, see the unfairness. So the tribunal, Vakf tribunal, uh, if, if you get a notice saying your, uh, uh, prop, your property is on Vakf land, then you get 30 days to eva uh, you know, evacuate the place or you, go, you can't contest that claim in a civil court or a, you know, with a civil judge, you have to go to a Vakf board. So judge, jury, prosecutioner, everybody is the same organization. So at least a level playing field and when we say secular, 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 government has no business running, uh, you know, uh, religious institutions. Uh, and why should the government care who will run it or a lot of people on the Hindu side or the so-called non-left side say till there is social reform, we will not do that. But I completely disagree with that. That's a, that's a, that's a bogey. bogey. Because, uh, 
you know, the, we didn't tell any other community saying till you, uh, you know, abolish polygamy or triple talaq, we will not give you control over the, uh, your uh, religious institutions. Why should this onus of reform only land on the shoulders of the Hindus? Someone will do it. Nobody asked who is going to be the uh, Gurudwara Prabandak committee. Some people from the community, they will form their own. Why are Hindus not worthy of uh, trust? That there will always be corruption, there will always be maladministration, there will always be casteism. So give them the chance, let's see, government can always oversee, even in the Kashi Vishwanath board, there is I think one person from the government, that can happen, but then to, for, till the time the last person in the, uh, this one is reformed and there is no caste, there is no nothing, till then we will keep it, I don't think that uh, argument really holds and Vikram, much. Vikram, just I think a few years ago, I know your state of course has I think some 33,000 temples, but bigger than your state is Tamil Nadu, which has I think 44,000 temples. Uh, which are controlled by the state government. And I think a couple of years ago, the Madras High Court had to pull up uh, the Charitable Endowments Trust to say that some 7,000 odd acres of land had completely gone missing from the records. So this is the way that these assets are being dealt with. They are being squandered away. Uh, I think, uh, honestly speaking, this is a burning issue which needs actually immediate action. We are, we are wondering about, I'm not saying, I'm not taking away from the fact that we need all of these historical places to be reviewed and researched, but this is truly a burning issue which needs attention of the government and it's stuff that the government can do without necessarily a lot of academic research. Yes. So Poonamji has an interesting addition to the manifesto to ensure very that much the because char the so power happens very will easily. come from Ville Parle, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> but no, this, I think, again, I'm saying, I know it's not any government's business in temples, mosques, anywhere. And we do have that basic feeling. I mean, I, that's what I can talk about BGP. But in coming times when you're governing, you're thinking about these so many uh, discussion on these so many institutions, temples, we need a certain kind of deliberation and discussion, which you also agree to it. Yeah. I'm not saying we have to reach to the last mile to Ante Uday. Mm -hmm. We need Uday before that. And we will surely look for it. But let's see in coming times how the third, uh, uh, third government and third term 3.0 works on how India is going forward with this oldest civilization with the young India taking it forward. So let's, let's believe wow. that. But today the book... <laughs> This book needs to be read by the Gen Z and Gen Alpha, which I have it at home. And they need to go through it because they're seeing the mother reading it for past two weeks. So they must be thinking it's really important. But I need to explain that also to them. Thank you. Before, thank uh, before we end, uh, I'd really like to thank Poonamji. Uh, I mean, this is a... Election time is the examination time for most, uh, like how it is for students. Uh, th that's how it is, you know, when elections strike. In the midst of that, I was very skeptical whether she'll actually uh, might bunk in the last minute, citing some important uh, mm -hmm. work. But then she gave me an assurance, like Shiva has given the assurance to all people in this book, uh, in the Skanda Puran. Uh, similarly, she said, wherever I am on 30th, yeah, on the 30th from 6 to 8, I am going to be there for this event. So I'm really, really very thankful to you, Poonamji, for coming uh, and for sharing your thoughts with us. And I'm sure, as a Shiv Bhakt yourself, the blessings would be very propitious in the coming days, uh, hopefully. And to Ashwin, who's always such a dear friend and someone who reads another author's books and also appreciates, uh, you know, very uh, generously. Authors are not very generous people. Uh, <laughs> there's so much of why should I read someone else's book, why should I do this and also openly uh, appreciate on social media and other platforms. It's so easy to appreciate you Vikram, you're <laughs> just outstanding, what can I say? Okay, now we are getting into too much of PDA, so uh, I'll just say thank you Ashwin and to Kushal. Kushal has been one of the best podcasters who's ensured that again, he also reads the book uh, and comes. Most podcasters just come to an event without doing any background. Achha, why did you write this book? How long did you take? What are the sources? The usual, uh, t you know, 10 questions which you can roll on for one hour. But uh, he comes in with all the details uh, that, you know, uh, one can ask and that makes the discussion so much more enriching. 
and very, very thankful to the Prabha Khaitan Foundation, to Swati ji and all of you for putting this all together and to each one of you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for coming so far on a Saturday evening, staying on for so long uh, and sharing my joy on this very, very significant occasion. Thank you so much. I know a lot of us would have wanted to, this session to go on, but time is of a sense and I will take back Poona ma'am's message oldest civilization, youngest population, and it's the time for India. So thank you, everybody. Thank you to all the guests on stage. Yeah, Vikramji, congratulations uh, on your new book. Vikramji will also be, you know, signing the books for all of us. The books are available outside on a 40% discount. Thank you so much. Good evening. Shankar